Okay, I think we're going to get started, everyone. Dr. Moussant and Dr. Selby, are you ready to get started? Yeah, we are ready right away. Just give us Great. a Great. <laughs> yeah, of course. I'll just go through this slide. So thank you, everyone, for attending this month's Teach Educational Rounds. With us here today, we have Dr. Benoit Moussant and Dr. Peter Selby, who will be presenting on improving care for older patients with depression. But before I get started, we're just going to go over a few housekeeping slides as per usual. First of all, if you're interested in obtaining a letter of completion for this month's Teach Educational Rounds, please make sure that you have registered for the webinar and have completed the pre-learning assessment. You have signed in to view the webinar using your first and last name, so I can track your participation. And you complete the post-learning assessment after the webinar. I will send a link to the post-learning assessment, and you'll have one week to complete this. These webinars are being live tweeted on Twitter, and you can follow us at PS Quit Smoking or use the hashtag TeachWebinar to post or read questions. Here is a biography of our faculty presenter, Dr. Moussant, who is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at University of Toronto. He has been designing and conducting clinical trials for hard-to-treat older patients with mood disorders for more than 25 years. Here are his disclosures. And here is a biography of our second presenter, Dr. Peter Selby. He is the Chief of Primary Care, Deputy, Deputy Physician in Chief Education, and a Clinician Scientist at CAMH. He's a professor at the University of Toronto and also the founder of the TEACH Project. Here are a list of his disclosures as well as our disclosures. Remember, the TEACH educational rounds are centered on evidence-based guidelines from the following sources. These materials, as well as the verbal presentations and any disclosures, set out only general principles and they do not replace the need for clinical assessments or treatment plans by healthcare professionals. And before I hand it off to our presenters, I would just like to do a quick polling question to gauge who has joined us here today. So in a minute, using your computer, could you please indicate which of the following organizations you work for? And if your organization isn't here, please feel free to type it in the chat box. So it looks like we have some family health teams, lots of family health teams, <laughs> public health units, the mental health agencies have joined us. And in the chat box, we have some workplace wellness, smokers helpline, cardiac rehab. Great. And now for our next poll, can you please indicate which of the following your discipline is? And you may need to scroll down to see all options. So we have some registered nurses, pharmacists, social workers, great. And for our final poll, can you please indicate which region your organization serves? So we have Toronto, Greater Area, Central East. We have a good diverse group of individuals joining us here today. That's great. Some people from Winnipeg, BC, awesome. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to our presenters. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy. So good uh, afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, late-life depression. And uh, the first slide of the subtitle is talk about fighting therapeutic nihilism, because uh, there are a lot of people who kind of Say well, if I were that this older person, and my kids had moved to Vancouver, and my husband was dead, and I had heart disease, then uh, of course I would be depressed. And then they feel that they don't need, even though they have acknowledged the depression or even diagnosed it, they don't need to treat it, which is absurd. If you say, well, I understand why this older person fell down the stair, the stair and broke her hip, you would still do a hip replacement. And actually, uh, for me personally, when I was a young uh, trainee, what attracted me to the field of psychiatry uh, was uh, because I was extremely impressed how treatment of depression in an older person can make an enormous difference in their functioning in a short period of time. There's almost no other condition where you can have somebody in a wheelchair 
holding their head, uh, not talking, and a few weeks later talking, smiling, and going back to live independently at home. So that's the framework of this presentation. And during the first about 15 minutes, I'm going to show you some general slide talking about a little bit the epidemiology, the diagnosis, and the treatment. And then my colleague, Dr. Selby, will talk about uh, the challenge of treating depression in some older patient in uh, a primary care context. And we'll discuss a program that has been created and that's available either in person through referral for the GTA or uh, via phone uh, throughout the province of Ontario. We cannot accept people who are outside of Ontario because of licensure issue. So uh, starting with the prevalence, actually, while the prevalence is fairly high, it's uh, estimated to be 3 to 5% in the community, overall, older people are fairly happy and content because they are wise and they adapt and are less likely to be depressed than a young adult or midlife adult. But still, in the community, it's about 3 to 5%. When you look at the, what depression in late life is associated with, you find it's associated with comorbid physical illness, and so the prevalence is higher in clinical setting, giving health professionals a distorted view. If you work in a long-term care home, for instance, uh, it has been estimated that 50% uh, of people who transition from community to long-term home go through a period of the clinically meaningful severe uh, depression. And so, and since the average uh, uh, survival of people admitted to nursing home is a couple of years, it means a lot of people in long-term care home are depressed. And professional have the impression that it's normative, but it's really not. Uh, now, the absolute number of depressed people is increasing with the aging of the population. And as I've already mentioned, it's highly treatable. And the number below are the number from one clinic uh, I was involved uh, with in my previous job. We systematically assess and track 173 patients referred to a specialized clinic for late life depression. And over a year, by following up to five step algorithm uh, that included both medication and psychotherapy, with 87% of all patients who stuck with us were free of depression. Only 4% did not get free of depression. But there is a 9% who, after two, three trials, kind of uh, got discouraged and dropped out. Uh, when you look at the clinical course of depression under usual care condition, the, the, the number that are usually cited is it's recognized in 50% of people. I think the recognition has improved over the past uh, decade. But even in those who are recognized, it's treated in 50% of people. And then in the 50% of the 50% you know, uh, who got treated, you have poor adherence, early treatment dropout, quite a few people who improve but don't reach remission and continue to suffer from depression, leading to recurrence and chronicity. So the data are fairly clear that if you are just treated under usual care condition, and it doesn't matter if you are treated by a psychiatrist or by a family physician or a nurse practitioner, the, the response rate uh, is the remission rate is uh, about between 15 and 30 percent. So most people with depression uh, do not uh, get better. And now with some fairly simple intervention, that can improve uh, to about uh, 80 percent. So most people are actually treatable. Treatment-resistant depression is quite rare. And treatment refractoriness, as I showed you in the previous slide, does exist. People respond to almost nothing. But it was 4% with medication psychotherapy. Probably half of those 4% will respond to brain stimulation. So it's really the rare patient. And if you are in a primary care setting, you should almost never see one of those patients in your practice. 
So uh, condition associated and that influence the differential diagnosis, depression, anything that damage your brain makes you at higher risk for depression. And so neurodegenerative illness like Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, history of brain trauma, multiple sclerosis, cerebrovascular disease, for instance, it's estimated that uh, uh, for, up to 40 percent of people after a stroke will have a depression. There are some conditions for some, actually, if you look at the biochemistry of neurotransmitter, it is not a surprise that metabolic conditions such as B12 or folate deficiency do uh, cause the depression and other neuropsychiatric uh, disorder. Folate deficiency in uh, Canada is almost now unheard of because of the fortification of various foods with folate to prevent uh, neural tube illness, but it's kind of masked sometimes B12 deficiency because we no longer see the megalocytosis that used to be associated with B12 deficiency. If you supplement somebody with B12 deficiency in folate, their uh, red blood cell remain normal, but if you measure their B12, you're going to find the deficiency. The classic hypothyroidism in older patients, some infectious disease, some specific cancer, some anemia, hyponatremia, congestive heart failure, renal of liver failure, chronic pain and opioid use are also associated with depression. So all those conditions are very common in the primary care setting in older patients, explaining the high prevalence, maybe a 10, 15 percent, as opposed to 3 percent in the community in more healthy elderly. So Tom Insel was for 15 plus years the director of the National Institute of Mental Health in the US. And in his last blog, he commented, how can we improve the quality of mental health care? And he said, we can do much better by delivering the treatment we have today. We can save lives, many lives, simply by closing the gap between what we know and what we do. And in some sense, and again, I am not picking up on any group that through both in the psychiatric sector and the primary care sector, what we find is what we do with usual care, we tend to uh, lack confidence in what we do. So we tend to follow the fat du jour. You know, you hear a conference like or a presentation like today, you, hear, you get a tip and you try it in your patient for the next few months, and then a new thing and you try something new. And at the end, it's not that we don't have enough treatment. We have probably too many antidepressants, too many augmentation strategies. And as a result, when you, you look at a typical practice, there is a small number of patients treated with a large number of different treatments. And so it's hard for clinicians to gain experience and gain confidence with one treatment. And, uh, and, and as a result, because we lack confidence when the patient or the family come and complain, we tend to feel pressed to do something, and often doing something means changing uh, treatment uh, too early, or, or contrary, there are also people who stay stuck on low dose of drugs that are not working, or even high dose of drugs that are not working. So ill-advised, ill-timed change, or no changes, and then we spend all our time obsessing on the treatment and because making decisions is exhausting instead of focusing on the patient. What we know from studies and very, very robust literature, I will show you a few slides, is based on best evidence or best guidelines. As I told you, we can actually treat most people. And if you use just, you limit yourself to a few favor or preferred steps, you tend to treat, because the depression is quite common, both in, what I'm saying, I'm talking of older patients, but it also applies to a younger patient. You end up treating a large number of patients, uh, even in a primary care setting, if you end up having a 5, 10% of your patient receiving the treatment for depression. The data in Canada tell, tell us that between 
about uh, 10 to 11 percent of adults and uh, 15 to 20 percent of older patients have been prescribed an antidepressant during the past month and is by and large by their primary care provider, family physician, nurse practitioner. Uh, so if we look at that large number of patients we treat, over time you should gain a lot of experience and nothing will work in everybody, but you will have enough great success that you will gain confidence and then you will feel uh, confident in keeping the course. Often, you know, if the medication, your first line or second line antidepressant is not working, what you need to do is optimizing the dosage, which is increasing it within the Health Canada guideline. And uh, that protects you against those bias or those knee-jerk reaction. And then you will see those patients who are not necessarily well after three, four weeks because you are caught you are increasing the dosage slowly, getting better week six, seven, eight. They turn the corner. The patient come back. There is a group of patients who improve slowly every week, but the more typical patient, I'm not getting better, I'm not getting better, and I don't know what happened, but last Wednesday I started feeling better in the past week, I've feeling, been feeling well. So, and, and for older patients, if you have... Uh, started dosage at low dosage, started your antidepressant, and you have titrated slowly, it may take 8, 10, 12 weeks to get a full trial. And at the end of the 10, 12 weeks, you should have with the first line drug maybe 40, 50% response. And then when you move to the second line drug, Maybe it's only 20, 30, and then the third line drug again, 20, 30. So after three steps, you have uh, help over, let's say, uh, a period of uh, six to 12, to 12 months, three, four steps. You will have help uh, the majority of your patient, and you will start to feel really confident that your treatment works. And then when people say it's not working, you say, well, why don't we wait a couple of more weeks or try to finalize the, the dosage, going to maximum dosage for this drug, and then if it doesn't work, we'll change. And then, because you don't really have to spend a lot of time thinking of the treatment, you already have your kind of algorithm in your head. You can really focus on the patient and address the psychosocial issue, maybe contributing to the depression. So I'm showing you one study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry showing psychiatry in orange. You have in six months the kind of remission rate that they got with standard treatment under usual care. And there is about 28% of the patient with uncomplicated depression went in full remission. And in green, you have the same patient. It was and the same doctor in a, under randomized condition following a two-step algorithm. And you can see that they get 78% of people well. For both the usual care and the two-step algorithm, pretty much all the action happen in uh, 12 weeks. And the reason is because there are two, two drugs to try. They fix the drug to really try to see the benefit of the measurement-based care and the algorithm as opposed to playing with different medications. So that's, as I said, there are a lot of studies like this. I'm showing you another study I was involved in, uh, in a primary care, older patient treated by family physician, nurse practitioner in the U.S. And you can see the same thing over two years than you have on this slide. I'm sorry you don't see the horizontal axis, but each box is four months, four, eight, 12, and then 24 months. And you can see that the intervention with an algorithm got, the patient got, more patients got better and they got better faster and the advantage was maintained over two more, two years. And there was, a psychotherapy in addition to a medication offered to patients who didn't respond to medication in this trial. And the, there is no secret, if you look at the same trial presented uh, in another paper, at any time point, 4, 8, 12, 18, 24 months, 
you had only about 50 personal patients under usual care were receiving guideline concordant treatment when it was about 90% of the people treated with the algorithm and the support of if you want a coach or a navigator. And Dr. Selby will talk more about this. So uh, that's, I've tried to convey that we can improve, that it's important to diagnose depression, that we can improve our outcomes by focusing on fairly simple, not necessarily the most esoteric treatment that you would believe a psychiatrist uses, and actually they don't. And, but I also want to finish by saying the, the process of care using a kind of what people have called a chronic care approach, like you would use for hypertension or diabetes, or uh, you know what we call collaborative care, in psychiatry remain essential. You need a lot of the progress seen in those research studies was by seeing patients regularly and monitoring their symptoms through measurement-based care, by encouraging patients and supporting them because patients who don't get better after one week, two weeks, three weeks tend to stop their antidepressant. They feel they are not working. They may even have side effects. So most patients will get worse before they get better. And when they get worse, they don't expect it and they stop the medication when their body would have gotten a new suicide effect, which then in with modern antidepressants well tolerated. But you need to uh, to to encourage the patient to go over that hump and to tolerate the side effect during the first couple of weeks while he or she waits for the benefits that may take four, or five, six weeks to come. And the sex effects tend to occur right away. The benefits are delayed. The patient tend to improve. I'm discovering that I am, it sounds as if <laughs> erasing the slide with my little pointer. So, and then, when the patient gets better, they need to understand that depression is not like an infection. You get an antibiotic for two weeks, your UTI goes away, and then you stop the antibiotics. It's more like uh, diabetes, uh, uh, hypertension, as I say, chronic care model. When once you get better, you continue to stay on medication and to not to get better but then to stay well and and that's another reason in the research study we find that people under usual care are not well when we come back six or 12 or 18 months or two years later because a lot of patients who got better stop their medication and suffer relapse and recurrence and the final point is that slide that line in the middle on this slide the patient personal illness models. So there is almost no patient that you're going to see, particularly older patients, who believe they feel bad because they have a chemical imbalance in their brain and they need to take a pill to fix the chemical imbalance. And it really doesn't make sense if you have lost your husband and your doctor to so your spouse, you're an older woman going through spousal bereavement, which is a fairly normative experience, unfortunately, because women married men who are in general, and those men in general are older than them, and in general, their life expectancy is a few years older. So most women in Western society who are married will go through spousal bereavement. And it makes no sense when they are crying and not sleeping when it goes beyond grief in about 20% of them. And they have a depression that needs to be diagnosed and treated. If you see them and you say, I'm going to give you a pill for your depression, they are going to be polite because that woman is 78. But they are not going to take it or they will stop it soon. 
unless you explain to them you're not trying to make them happy about the loss of their husband with a happy pill, but an antidepressant will help them to sleep and to have a better appetite and to have energy so they can grieve the loss of their husband more in a more healthy fashion and hopefully after some time not focus just on the sadness of the loss and the grief, but focus on the uh, good time they had and good experience and start to talk about their husband and the loss with their children. So if you explain that you're not trying to eradicate the grief, but you're trying to make them more healthy so they can grieve in a healthy fashion, that new widow may be willing to take the medication. And the last example of a personal illness model, somebody with chronic pain who has pain in their back and has tried a variety of painkiller, opioid, maybe some surgery, and the back is preventing them from sleeping, and they feel so bad that they are starting to have suicidal ideation, they develop a depression associated with the chronic pain. If you tell them, I'm going to treat you for your depression, they will be insulted. They will feel, well, that doctor doesn't understand that I'm in pain. It's not all in my head. And they will feel stigmatized by getting a diagnosis of depression and an antidepressant. So if you tell them, look, the main pain is mostly in the brain, and that pain that's in your back is in your brain, and those drugs that were initially developed as antidepressants have been shown in people like you who have severe depression that interact with their functioning and their quality of life can be treated by those drugs that work on chemical in the brain and the spine and affecting the transmission in the brain. The patient who is desperate about the back pain may be willing to take your antidepressant, and then once you treat the depression, they may get better. And then when they get better, they may be able to talk about the depression and the suicidality, and they may even be now that they are better willing to taper the opioid. So I think that's uh, so a slight segue on treatment resistant depression. They are a sub group, and if you use two, three-step algorithm, it should be uh, maybe 30, 40 percent of patients that you're not going to help. And I think Dr. Selby is going to now uh, talk about uh, that group of patients and something that we are trying to do and that are evidence-based and something we can do to support you in your practice with those patients. So you have the conclusion that I uh, give up, that I uh, do not give up in particular, and, and then I'm happy to pass the seat and the mic to Dr. Selby. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mulsan, for that. Distilling all your knowledge of uh, and experience for so many years into this. And some of you may be wondering why is STOP and TEACH so interested in this? There's a couple of reasons. So we've known the association between depression and tobacco for a long time, and it's not clear which one causes which, but we do see this concurrence. And then when we did STOP, the STOP study and the STOP program in primary care and community settings, 50% of people coming in to quit smoking had a mental illness, most of which were depression. And, and then when people were starting to do the PHQ-9, the questions, it became quite apparent to us that we had a significant number of people who were depressed, actively depressed symptoms on the rating scale of a score more than 10. And when you looked at them, they tend not to not to quit as much. So at the same time, we recognized and started, I got interested in looking at what was the impact of depression and depression being such a huge and common problem in society today uh, that it, and its impact on society is huge that when, when Dr. Mulsan was talking about this 
study, which is more real world, that could benefit primary care where patients come in with all sorts of presentations. You know, they don't come in and say, doctor, I'm depressed, because depression, as you know, it can have the feeling of sadness and it can have the feeling of loss of interest in, in things, but it can also present with what we would call very vegetative things, not sleeping, not eating, or eating too much, low energy, and then cognitive things like lack of concentration, not able to process information. And as a family doctor, sometimes you can't tell whether that's a dementia, there's a loss of life, you know, something that's going on, or this untreated depression. And, and so this study that, that I'm going to talk to you about is much more real world and how do we have meaningful outcomes for patients. And so when we look at this, and given that, as Dr. Molson said, that this study for patients is not just enrolling the patient, but also their prescriber, so whether that's a nurse practitioner or physician, it creates an opportunity for one-to-one -one kind of training, coaching, and advice uh, for the patient. So I'll just quickly go over what that study involves. And, um, and so people can see what they, what they need to do. Uh, um, I'm trying to get the next slide going, but it's not working. Oh, there we go. So what has happened is, as you know, even with like the STOP study, we are really looking at what are the patient-centered outcomes in research. Yes, we want to know patients really get the outcomes. It's not so much as the research institute that, that, that decides what is going to happen, but it's in, in, in uh, collaboration with patients. And so PCORI is a US-based, uh, actually funded through the Affordable Care Act, uh, but to create more meaningful research whereby what is different is you can compare different treatments rather than giving treatment to people within clinical uh, settings or research settings, put it out in the real world and find out which treatment works best for which patient. And clearly in designing this study, it involves all stakeholders. So we talked a little bit about uh, treatment uh, uh, of depression in the elderly, but treatment-resistant depression is, is something that comes in where people have tried two or more antidepressants and they aren't getting better. So what does, it, what does that person do? And, and so there is no guidance and often trying to get access to a geriatric psychiatrist or to get a psychiatrist to see this patient is very difficult. And as you know, with primary care reform, these patients are being seen by the team members, they are seen by the nurse or the family or the pharmacist or other members of the team in addition to the family doctor. And sometimes it is important to, to, when you're talking to the patient to understand as a team what can be done. So for example, somebody took the uh, sertraline and did not uh, respond and the family doctor shifted it to or, or switched to uh, around the vaccine, and again, the person did not respond, what, what are they going to do? So as we talked a little bit about, it's important to treat depression, and I'm just going to skip over the slide because we, we, we've talked about this uh, in detail, and I'm just going to go to the next one. But what we want to do is that in collaboration with all our primary care sites and our community sites is that the team will partner with the with the providers. Now, of course, if there are providers in the GTA and they don't they want to make a referral, that's possible too. And you know, we've got sites at CAMH and Sunnybrook and and, and Baycrest and St. Mike's and North York. Uh, North York is up. And uh, UHN, sorry, UHN, not North York. We've got the sites that people can come to, but we realize that people are, live all across the province and people don't necessarily travel. So we have in this study, there is also a virtual way of helping the patients by phone. So what is this study? In the study, we do a simple thing. Really, when the pe people are stuck, people over the age of 60 who continue to have major depression and are not responding to treatment, the real issue is that the advice given to the practitioner is 
it can be one of three options. So one is they can add another medication, aloprazole, and these medications were chosen because they are already naturally available on the drug formulary for people, uh, in, 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 for seniors, and secondly, that they are cheap generic drugs. And they have effects that have been proven to work, but what isn't known is which one is the best strategy uh, to work. And so really, in partnership with the, with the primary care provider, what we're trying to establish is which, is which one is the most acceptable and which one will work. So, so what happens is they get randomly advised to use either aripiprazole or bupropion. And bupropion is another interesting drug. As you know, we've used it for smoking cessation as well. Or alternatively, in the third arm, they stop all the other medication and switch to bupropion. And this goes on for 10 weeks, and they are monitored almost weekly um, by uh, one of the study uh, team, uh, every, sorry, every two weeks, to ask how they're doing. So one of the other things is they're getting the supportive care uh, from, uh, remotely by, the, by trained RAs from, from the study who provide them that support. And what they do is, as they're monitoring it, they're also keeping the team up to date as to what is happening. We see, look at whether their symptoms are getting better, how their well-being is, uh, how the safety is, are they having any, you know, any falls, and how they're functioning cognitively and mobility. So all the things that are meaningful to, to elderly patients in terms of getting back into the, to the swing of things are all meaningfully captured, including the response to the medication. So it's not just about the medication. Yes, the medication is a major part of the trial, but it's also about somebody keeping in touch with the, with the patient and not creating an additional burden or visit burden onto the clinic. Um, but the clinic is, is kept abreast as to what is happening. And then after one year, the, uh, uh, the continuation phase continues after that for one year where the patient is, is assessed at 4, 8, and 12 months uh, for that um, to see whether the benefits continue uh, to be accrued by that patient. So basically, as I mentioned, we're really looking at people who are age of 60 or older who are treatment resistant. Uh, you know, we, we, as you know, in the STOP program, we use the PHQ uh, on every patient pretty much. And so you can see that people who have a PHQ 9 or 6 or greater who have had a history of uh, a major depression and have tried to, to a more antidepressants, uh, they are eligible. Uh, the exclusion is obviously dementia, unstable medical illness, and unable to take any of the medications we are consider considering. But again, uh, if you're not sure, if you refer the, the RA talks to them, figures it out with them, and then comes back to the prescriber, to, to get the final consent and agreement if the patient is, is willing. Um, the, the, these are the questions. You've seen the PHQ-9, and, and we have that. And, and as you know, the, uh, uh, the mood management uh, study in, in, in uh, STOP is going on right now, and it's coming to an end shortly. But we've realized that our, our primary care partners are very adept in filling out the PHQ-9 and monitoring uh, people's depression. So. Uh, so we think it's, it's, and we have patients there who are over the age of 60. So if they do meet those criteria, they could be eligible, and the practice could, uh, the prescriber could be eligible to participate in this program. So really all they have to do is, is, is contact us. You have the contact information, the phone number, and the, uh, and the website. And what is really done is that there's a recommendation to the prescriber to to prescribe a particular medication at a specific dose. The study team doesn't take it on unless, of course, they've been referred into Toronto and seen by one of the, uh, in, uh, in one of the hospitals I mentioned. But otherwise, the, the ultimate decision lies with the prescriber under guidance from us. And what we do is help the prescriber monitor it. So they call the, we call the patient every two weeks. We ask them about their symptoms, as I mentioned. And then we can make recommendations about dose changes, et cetera, and, and essentially uh, coach the provider as they are getting comfortable managing this patient. So it's a partnership uh, using measurement-based collaborative care to help the patient as opposed to simply a report that comes to the prescriber and says, you know, 
do this, do this, do this, but no way to connect back with the, with, the, with the consultant. This way you have strong connections to the consultant and uh, every week the, the, the group meets and discusses uh, some of the issues that are coming up with the patients and, uh, and that way we can we be on top of what some of the issues the patients are facing. So if the patient has a side effect, of course, they either report to us or they, they'll report to you and we follow up. And again, the study psychiatrists provide recommendations to the prescriber and the patient based on obviously the safety labs and drug monitoring. So in essence, it's really like having a psychiatrist by your side as you are managing your patient with treatment-resistant depression in the elderly. Uh, and again, there is compensation for the, uh, for the practice uh, or the practitioner because of the work that may go in finding patients who have this criteria or for, um, uh, for that. And, and then patients are also compensated for their participation. So uh, the physicians are compensated for their time and in a one-time fee just in, in identifying patients, but the participants are also compensated uh, for the for the visit, uh, if they if they do come in person. And next slide, there we go. So, if there are providers on this call who are interested, or if you know providers, many of you work in teams, and we see there are pharmacists. We think pharmacists are often have the best eyes. They know their patients who have been through uh, more than one antidepressants. Uh, <clears throat> there are queries as well that can be run. Uh, especially if you're in one of the uh, family health teams. Um, but even in the EMR, you could run a query and see which patient over 60 has been on two or more antidepressants. And, and as a quality improvement project, you could figure out a way to get them into, uh, into the program. Uh, so that is one way you could do it. And the provider provides a consent form just once. And then after that, all the patients that they come through have to sign their own separate consent form, but the provider only provides it once. Just that's the agreement to participate. And, um, and then we just begin working with your patients, uh, obviously not uh, with your collaboration, of course. Um, and so that's how, that, how this has been designed. And what is in it for a practice or a team practice essentially is one is, you know, at, for the practice level itself, it's better managing people who are depressed, older patients, because, I mean, I don't, as, I don't know if you heard this, but what Dr. Monsant has talked about and others have talked about, untreated depression certainly is a big risk factor for developing dementia, and that means it's a huge impact on people's quality of life, where they live, where they go into nursing homes, and, and I, you know, I wasn't even aware of this, that your survival after you get into nursing home on average is two years. I mean, that is really, uh, you know, is, if we can help people stay at home healthy and not just physically healthy, but mentally healthy, all of those things can go a long way in having a huge impact on society. And here we are trying to help people quit smoking, but if we don't get that depression, you know, yes, you know, they may not quit, but on the other hand, they may not have a good quality of life if we just leave the depression untreated. So what is in it for a practice is you get evidence-based better management of the uh, depression in the elderly pa patient population. And we know that most populations, uh, practices don't have that many elderly patients, but you do have them. And no single pop uh, patient uh, practice has so many, but it, we still have a duty to manage them. The other is it'll be state-of-the-art science. It'll be, in, and one of the things is this collaborative care doesn't require a lot of downtime from the practice because a, a lot of it is that asynchronously it doesn't disturb your regular flow as communication, electronic, uh, by, by phone, by elect, and electronic means and by, by letter that fits within the workflows of going on. So it's not a lot of time down for the practice to, to, to understand what is needs to be done, and so you're getting just-in-time knowledge to make better decisions for your patients. And the treatment recommendations that come will also be for patients who may not be eligible. So say somebody who is over the age of 60 gets referred to the study, and they haven't had a good trial of antidepressants. After that assessment, a recommendation may come back to the, practi to the practitioner and say, you know what, here's the recommendation, try this medication for X weeks and let's reassess, and if the patient is doing fine, then great. If not, they may, they may be eligible for the study. So, so as, as a way to help the practice, there's this additional service being provided 
to the practice in managing the elderly with depression uh, where it's unclear what to do. And uh, again, there's, we're trying to minimize the Im impact on a team-based practice in terms of uh, time taken to identify patients. So there's a bit of compensation for the practice that can go either to the physician, depending on how the structure is, or to the practice itself. So if you have any questions, we'll open it up. Um, and I can see that people have been, begun to type in questions. So Dr. Multan and I will try to get into this together. It's a really tiny screen and camera, and uh, we're going to try to read this, the fine print. But this final slide, as you know, this is being recorded. So feel free to refer colleagues who weren't able to be here to, to, to view the webinar. But we have questions up there. And uh, Cheryl's question, I think, is, is the first question that I saw. But uh, feel free to start typing in your questions, and we'll start some discussions going about whatever you've heard. So Shell says, can, you can or should we still refer a patient who has previously failed the study drugs? We usually get to this part in clinic, but it's after this we struggle with. Thanks. So they've been on bupropion. They've been on, on Abilify. Uh, so if you are in the GTA and they are willing to come to a clinic, we certainly welcome them. And we have other steps, for instance, using uh, older drugs like lithium or nortriptyline as a tricyclic. We have brain stimulation with the RTMS or TDCS or ECT. So you can certainly refer them to CAMH, go to the CAMH website, download the form do referral for or geriatric clinic. They will be seen relatively promptly. It's not going to take uh, four or five months. It's going to take uh, two to six weeks. We'll see them. If you, if you want to, if you are elsewhere in the province uh, and you're, it's unpractical uh, for your patient to come to downtown Toronto, it's harder because the program described by Dr. Selby by phone is really focused on the use of those augmentation uh, and strategy, which are uh, what I would consider uh, second and third line. You know, if you consider that the SSRI and the SNRI in all the guidelines and mirtazapine, those three, you know, sertraline, escitalopram, valafaxine, duloxetine, mirtazapine, are the drug that people will use first and second line. The bupropion and the repressal are like the third and the fourth line, and that's what this study focuses on. So that's the first question. And can I just add, Stephanie, if you can go to our CAMH website and, create, and just copy the link into the chat box, then you can just share that how to make a referral to access CAMH. There's a form there. We can just put it into the chat yes. box, and then we can also save it to the website, the study website, and put it as a slide so, so people so need the next, The next comment, no mention of whether patients are smoking in this. So the yeah. I let Dr. Selby was, I thought he had addressed it. Yeah, so whether they are smoking or not is, is immaterial. I mean, as you know, uh, in, as people get older, the prevalence of smoking tends to drop. But if you take a look at who continues to smoke as they get older, they tend to have comorbidities. Typically, the, the number one comorbidity is that they have another addiction, uh, and they have and their smoking is part of it. Two is that they have a mental illness, and typically it's a depression that they keep going in. For this particular study, it's immaterial whether they smoke or not. They can still come into this one. Uh, you know, we're just seeing that there's so much overlap with these behaviors that we've got to start looking at. I mean, as as, as Dr. Mulsan said, and what Pokori has come out is to really look at this patient-oriented way and looking at the whole patient as opposed to, you know, uh, one aspect of them. And that's why even in STOP, we don't only look at smoking. We look at smoking, we look at their, their mood and their depression, and we look at their alcohol, and we look at the other factors that can all affect their outcomes. And, and I think that taking a whole person approach is, is consistent with this optimum study as well, because in the elderly, as you can imagine, and I've learned as well, in partnership with Dr. Mulsad, is that these patients really, it's not that they're only depressed. They're depressed plus have a whole bunch of other things that go on with it. So, so but managing the depression, 
creates the ability to often manage the other things. We know that if people are actively depressed, you can't get their diabetes under control. You can't get their heart. That's a big risk factor for heart disease. So leaving people depressed is, in a sense, uh, you know, it's commonly done because we don't understand it, but it has huge health implications. So we have looked at this, and there is that kind of a hierarchy of priority mm -hmm. that people have in primary care. And for instance, if a primary care provider sees an older patient with hypertension and depression, it's not that they miss the depression. If they come up with the kind of logic that the hypertension is a more acute problem, putting the patient at risk for a stroke and need to be treated first, or you That's mentioned right. the yeah. diabetes. Yeah. So they tend to focus on that with the idea, once the blood pressure is under control, I will treat the depression. But what really happened is as long as the patient is depressed, they're not going to be adherent with your diabetes or your hypertension treatment, and therefore you may adjust, yes. add, replace drug. Yes. You are uh, wasting your time, and it sounds counterintuitive, but it does make sense to, to do the depression first. And in terms of addiction, there have been a long debate in psychiatry where if somebody is depressed and drinking, maybe the low mood is due to drinking, or we discuss the smoking and the depression, maybe the, the, they are treating the... And there is people who say, well, you would need to stop the drinking first, and once you have been sober for a couple of months, if you are still depressed, you should treat the depression. That's theoretical. That makes sense. But in practice... If your patient is depressed and drinking or is depressed and smoking or is depressed and has chronic pain, you are not going to make a lot of progress on the physical issue until the depression is under control. So psychiatrists would tend to say, look, you have a treatable condition. We don't know what's what. We don't understand completely the biology or the causality. But what we know is when the depression is under control, you have a chance to treat the chronic pain or the smoking or the drinking. So you start there because it's, in some sense, easier. Now, there are more questions that came while we under did. So there, first of all, there's the link. We can pull as we mail the information. Yes, so you have the link so for the CAMH uh, referral. How, uh, one second, how long will the study continue? There's a whole a bunch couple, of Okay, let's go through the question let's one go, by one. Wow, the questions came up. We have okay. previously failed the study drug. There is no mention of smoking. What can patients do who do not have primary care provider? Any health professional can refer to the study. And uh, and can refer and and can refer to the CAMH uh, link we and your geriatric group. And for the geriatric group, for those who are in the GTA, we will accept self referral from patient themselves and family member. And if people don't have a primary care provider, we'll try to hook them up. If you are in the rest of the province, because that work by phone require a local prescriber, we need one. But we will accept a referral from a cardiologist or, or other health professional who are willing to work in partnership. You don't need to be a family physician or nurse practitioner. Next question, uh, there is, uh, can patient do, okay. Uh, do how long it. will the study be continuing to enroll participants for a couple of more years? We are negotiating to, the referral has been slow. You know, everybody say we need help, but then they say, well, it's not the help we needed. So, yeah. so the, the, the referral have been slow. The study should finish in 18 months, but we are negotiating with the founder to enroll for at least another additional year. So do you have flyer? We can post as well as email information. So uh, you could certainly, if you can print the slide, but if not, send an email to the person called Kyle Fitzgibbon on that slide or any of us and yeah. we'll send it. So any of those emails and ask us. We have some swag if you want. We have some pen cards uh, and we can certainly give you a little uh, pamphlet that you can post. Uh, you, so let's go back down. And, and also at the same time, you know, if, if there is a team in Ontario that is interested in having uh, you know, a, a personalized webinar, lunch and learn with the physicians there. Uh, we, we, can, we can certainly talk to you about that and have one of our, our colleagues and one of our investigators and, and project uh, uh, director um, uh, to come out and do some of that. So we can, we can negotiate that depending on, on the need and the demand. 
uh, for something like that. N next question. If people are smoking and taking bupropion for their, for their smoking, are they still, but they are depressed, are they still eligible? If you are taking bupropion up to 300 milligrams per day, you are still eligible because in the study with the support will escalate the bupropion to 450. So if you get randomized to bupropion, either the augmentation or the single drug will escalate it. There is a little tricky step, unfortunately. In order to do that, if you're on bupropion, you need to stop the bupropion for two weeks, get randomized, and get one of those three treatments. Knowing that dementia is an excellent criteria of study decision made for interested participants with cognitive impairment. So another benefit of referring to a study, we will screen the patient, and we will tell you if the cognitive impairment is above the threshold. And, and we use uh, the... Sorry? Yes. So what, yeah. No, we, we use, but I, I'm trying to ask for uh, RA. What's the exact name? We use a, a, a screening instrument. I cannot answer, understand the name by phone or in person, and we'll screen. And if they are too cognitively impaired, we'll tell you. Again, if you are in the GTA or memory clinic, at CAMH could uh, also then give you advice. If you are outside. We will give you advice, but we won't be able to be involved in the monitoring. And by the way, in doubt, we welcome referral. Even if you are remote, we will make uh, a day, uh, an assessment if the patient is willing. We'll share the result of the assessment. And if the patient is not eligible for the study, we'll still give you some recommendation based on the assessment, but we won't be able to follow the patient and provide the coaching. Is there a dependency created due to uh, Aripriprizole bupropion, no, none of, none of the drugs we use in this study are considered to create a dependence, and uh, there are some antidepressants where people may have some withdrawal issue and get some side effect, like flu-like symptom when they stop, but that's not the case for either Aripriprizole or bupropion. So I'm just going to add to that, so what we have seen in some communities case reports where people have taken to injecting bupropion for, and, and with actually significant uh, side effects and because it, it causes a lot of necrosis of, of veins and arms. So we've been hearing some, especially in Northwest Ontario. However, with this patient population, we don't think they're at a high risk for that. And usually the people who end up injecting bupropion are, generally have a coexisting active other addiction, typically to stimulants. So having said that, it's not a true addiction, but we see this misuse happening, and we're not sure why that happens. Sorry, I should come into the camera. We're not sure why that happens. Uh, and and with the uh, with the aripiprazole, there are some rare effects of people having sort of disinhibition and may stand up spending a bit more. But again, these are case reports. They tend to occur with that. But again, because of the strong monitoring that's going on in the study, it's highly unlikely that these things would would, would go missed. And, and essentially, in essence, the patient population being chosen for this is less likely to, to do that. Stopping the medications is not associated with kind of withdrawals. There's a, neither of those. Neither of those are. So, yeah. So, uh, so another. next question. Uh, are there any suicidal tendencies? So, uh, it's interesting. The, the, all the antidepressants, including bupropion, have a black box saying there have been reports of people on antidepressants uh, being suicidal. When the data, when looked at by suicide experts, people believe that it's a problem that's actually in younger patients. And when you look at the epidemiologic data, that antidepressants protect against suicide in older patients. But there is a black box on uh, psychotropic medication and there's a debate even in younger patients, is it that you get better and as you get better, you, you, get, uh, you, you get more energy and, and then you may act on suicidal uh, ideation that you had but you didn't have the motivation, now you're, slightly, you're still depressed mm -hmm. but you're slightly better. So long historical debate. As Dr. Selby mentioned, in this study at every visit, on the phone, we use a suicide questionnaire and we have an algorithm and a protocol to identify and manage high-risk suicide. So that is the benefit of participating in a program like this. And also one more thing, you know, 
suicide on antidepressants was a bigger concern when we use older antidepressants like tricyclics where a single week's dosing in the person's hands could cause them harm. The therapeutic index with these medications is pretty high, both for bupropion and for uh, aripiprazole. So the chances of them being you know, overdosing or dying or using it as a lethal means is very small. Um, now, so, so overall, if you take all of those factors from intent, monitoring, risk mitigation, and the types of medications, it's a theoretical issue that you're considering here. Now, this being said, being old, being yes. white, being a male, having a substance uh, use yes, disorder, right. all and all those are risk factor right. for depression, and the number one risk factor is having an untreated depression. So in this study, uh, like in any of those studies, if you are going to treat several hundred patients, and we had an experience in our previous study in Toronto, we treated 